basically re-enfranchise them in addition to getting rid of all these for-profit stupid fines uh, that they pay uh, upon release from prison. Uh, so those are a few things we have to do in addition to ending qualified immunity, uh, ending the transfer of weapons from the federal government to local governments, ending no-knock warrants, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. So, so much work to do there. Uh, must We must reallocate resources toward true public safety, like food security and housing security and, and jobs. Uh, when, when, when the hood needed jobs, they gave us police, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. And we have to reverse the impact of all of that. So that's part of the work I want to do in Congress. And, you know, as the uh, pandemic uh, basically uh, forces people out of their own homes because they've lost their jobs and they've been left behind with uh, without another round of stimulus, I mean, we, we just desperately really need uh, fighters in Congress who will demand more. I mean, the, the CARES Act was one thing, and, you know, the more robust unemployment benefits were, were great, but obviously uh, those benefits have expired. And now you see Americans getting evicted from their homes right now. I mean, it's, it's absolutely disgusting. Have you thought about uh, how you plan on working with members of Congress uh, to, you know, in a strategy essentially to ensure that there will be another round of stimulus for average Americans as opposed to massive corporate bailouts? Well, I think it's a huge win for us to pick up at least one Senate seat thus far. Uh, if we can pick up three more, that would be huge. And obviously it's easier if uh, Trump wins, excuse me, if Trump loses the White House. But for me, it's about, you know, not just organizing uh, my peers uh, inside and of Congress. It's about applying pressure from the outside. And it's about using the power of my voice in the bully pulpit to bring attention to the stories I'm hearing here on the ground in my district and the stories that are taking place across the country. I mean, I haven't even been sworn in yet, and I'm already working with tenants here, pushing back against management companies and landlords who are trying to intimidate them and force them out of their homes. But New York does a lot of good work around rent stabilization and making sure people have legal representation in court. Some of those rent stabilization laws need to be brought to a federal level. But to your point, first and foremost, let's strengthen the HEROES Act, let's pass it in the Senate, uh, and let's get the resources to the people who need it most. I mean, here in Yonkers, for example, our unemployment rate is triple what it was a year ago at this point because of the pandemic. So, so much work to be done and, and, and people have so many needs. And tonight is hopefully step one towards meeting those needs. Let, let me stick with the uh, first uh, policy we're talking about, criminal justice reform. Because as you read that list, uh, to progressives' ears, it sounded fantastic, uh, and we would love to to get every single thing that you mentioned on that list. And there will be ranges of of uh, what uh, the establishment wing of the Democratic Party is willing to accept. Um, by the end of Obama's term, they were still not willing to accept legalizing marijuana, which I just it blows my mind every time when I think about it. Uh, if I assume if there is any hesitation around that, that that good trouble would ensue immediately. Is that a fair assumption? <laughs> That's a fair assumption, yes. Uh, I'm just waiting for this night to be over, the AP to call our race <laughs> so that we can get to work immediately. Uh, that That's the bottom line. And again, this is not about me. Um, this is about common sense. This is about what the majority of American people want. And this is about us establishing ourselves as a moral and humanitarian leader, both domestically and around the world. And enough is enough with the nonsense that's been taking place over the last 50 years. You know, we incarcerate more people per capita than anywhere in the world. Incarceration is torture. I don't care how you draw it up. And we incarcerate race and poverty. Uh, you know, and that's just that's just oppressive, and it's a new form of slavery, and it's unacceptable, right? So the work begins tomorrow. We're not even waiting till we get to Congress, because the people here, 
uh, need relief and support, and the people throughout the country need the same thing. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to working with my colleagues, and I hope that they are more responsive to the American people. But if they are not, then we have to do what we have to do. Yeah, and, and when you get to qualified immunity and uh, and solitary confinement, that's where you're going to get a lot more pushback. Uh, and that's where we need even more good trouble. But uh, one step at a time, as, as you rightly say. Uh, I'm curious. But, I but it's, it's crazy. I just want to say, like, you know, we need more empathy in Congress, right? I'm going to need for my colleagues to put themselves in the shoes of Jacob Blake's. Uh, make believe Jacob Blake is there. Is their son, you know, make a make believe George Floyd is, is their is their child. Make believe Breonna Taylor is their niece. Like we we got to understand that th this is hitting home for so many in poor communities and communities of color, and people in Congress are so far removed from that, right? So it's about having conversations from the perspective of or, or, or with the sense of empathy and compassion, and really personalizing it for people because how can you support? solitary confinement it, it's it's torture period and no one in congress would want their child or their grandchild or their niece or nephew to be placed in, in behind bars under any circumstances let alone solitary confinement yeah well that's the kind of strength that progressives love to hear let's keep it real um uh, ryan i want to give you an opportunity to jump in here uh and then i i, I have a kind of a mechanics question that I've always been curious about that I want to ask you, Jamal. But Ryan, go ahead. Uh, Jamal and I were actually uh, rolling around his district uh, this morning and this this afternoon. And one one thing you saw or didn't see were in most places were voters, which which speaks to the uh, the effect of early voting. You know, people have really adopted this as a, as a practice. And I, I don't think there's Going to be any going back, I think the you know, and I think it's a it's a better system overall. The the idea that if if it if it rained on a particular Tuesday once every four years, that you'd have a different you know public policy direction for a country, uh, is is absurd, uh, and it, it and it does away with these uh, October surprises that people come to uh, regret considering surprises later, like say the you know, the James Comey letter just a couple of days before. The election, so you know, we now, as Jamal called it today, we have an election season, where the where the last day of voting ends on election day. The next step is for election officials to figure out how to start pre canvassing those votes, how to start you you know once that you can start counting them when they come in. You just set up a process for that, uh, so that when the polls close, you can announce what those results are, and then you can put all of your resources into into counting because you know the reason that we're all up, up in the air right now. We might be looking at a landslide election for Biden. We might be looking at a win for Trump, and we we just don't know because they don't know uh, they don't know how to kind of uh, count the, this new system that we have. Yeah. So Jamal, is it just to follow up on that real quick? New York does not have the best uh, system of voting when it get, comes to opening it up for more uh, people to get uh, involved, especially in the primaries. Uh, you're going at the federal level, but is there any influence you could do uh, to get New York to to be more open in, in their voting, especially in Democratic primaries? Yes, uh, there's a ton of influence. One of the things that I've been uh, telling the elected officials and the organizers that I've been meeting with since we won the primary is we have to do a lot more uh, collaborating uh, with each other, cooperating with each other, and working together to get things done for our districts. What I'm learning is, you know, many work in isolation, and they're more concerned about their sort of day-to-day -day jobs, and they're not working and leveraging resources of each of their offices to get things done for the district. So absolutely, it's something that, you know, I can I can lend my voice to, I can advocate for, and it's something that, that needs to happen. Uh, to Ryan's point, you know, today we, we couldn't find voters uh, because early voting works so well. I mean, if we went to five uh, places, uh, there, were, there was one long line in one area, in one place, and the other spots, they were just trickling, trickling voters. But what happened during the early voting season uh, when the lines were astronomical, they were ridiculous. We had people, I waited three hours and 45 minutes to vote. 
uh, the first day of early voting. So we need more sites. We need more machines. We need more <laughs> poll workers. And we need a better system to count votes as they come in so that election night, uh, on election night, we could be done with it. Yeah, a hurricane just hit Nicaragua. Uh, there but for the grace of God go us. We could have hit Florida and Texas, and then we'd be having a completely different conversation about this election. And Jamal, uh, I've always been curious. You defeated Elliot Engel in the primary, um, and he was a very powerful Democrat, and, and obviously was a bit contentious, as any race would be. Uh, do, do you have you guys already talked about a transition uh, of constituent services and those type of things? Yes, uh, I have an amazing chief of staff. Her name is Sarah Idrisu. Uh, she's been on board now for about a month, uh, but she's so brilliant and relentless. It's like she's been working with us for a year. Uh, so she's been in touch with uh, Congressman Ingalls, uh, chief of staff in his office, so that the transfer of any cases that they've been working on uh, takes place. And it's as smooth and, and as just a transition as possible. Uh, because whatever he was working on, we want to pick up and continue to do that work. And we want to also figure out how to continue to leverage resources in the way that he did for this district in particular areas. So those conversations are happening, yes, and so far they're, they're very cordial. All right, that's fantastic. And by the way, as we were speaking, uh, your fellow Just Democrat, Ilhan Omar, uh, has won, and that just got announced. Uh, so uh, an even larger caucus for the Just Democrats uh, in the next term. Jamal Bowman. Yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to, like, her, uh, Rashida, Alex, and Nayana, like, kicking ass tonight. Like, I want them to crush their opponents tonight because, you know, there, there's been some money put behind their challengers. And I want, like, people to see that you wasted your money. You cannot mess around with these badass women who are changing the world. So <laughs> I, I can't wait to see those results. And it, it looks like AOC's opponent will be a, is at about 24 percent right now. So that, that, that's the ass-kicking that you asked for, uh, duly <laughs> delivered. Uh, <laughs> asking ye shall receive. Um, all right, Jamal Bowman, uh, going to kick some ass in Congress. Uh, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Of course, y'all. Peace and love. See you soon. Yep, absolutely. All right, so that was a great interview and a great moment uh, and a moment that I would have dreamed about uh, happening uh, when this cycle began. Uh, I'll give you one more piece of good news uh, from New York. Richie Torres, another progressive, has won, and his election has been called the 15th district in New York. Uh, but now, before we take the break, I got to give you some bad news. The New York Times has called Lindsey Graham's election. Lindsey Graham has won and defeated Jamie Harrison. We will talk about that. We will talk about the state of the Biden-Trump election. How close is it when we return?